To be useful to the aerial navigator, positions located on the celestial sphere must be transferred to the Earth. The relationship between the observer's position on the Earth and his zenith on the celestial sphere has already been demonstrated. Similarly, a relationship exists between a body on the celestial sphere and the point on the Earth directly beneath it. This point is called the geographical position, or GP, of the particular celestial body. It is the point which, at a given instant, has that body at its zenith. If a body's geographical position is known, its meridian on the Earth is also known. Using this meridian and the Greenwich meridian, which is the zero meridian for longitude, the Greenwich hour angle, or GHA for the particular body, can be measured. It is the angle at the pole between the meridian of a celestial body and the Greenwich meridian. It is measured to the west through 360 degrees. Another type of hour angle, which was discussed in connection with the celestial sphere, can also be represented on the Earth. It is the angle at the pole between the observer's meridian and the meridian of the celestial body. To distinguish it from other types of hour angles, it is called local hour angle, or LHA. It is found by combining Greenwich hour angle and the navigator's longitude. The air almanac is consulted to get the Greenwich hour angle of the observed celestial body. Next, from his dead reckoning, the navigator determines his longitude fairly accurately. The Greenwich hour angle of a celestial body represents the longitude of its geographical position, and the observer's longitude represents his angular distance from the Greenwich meridian. Local hour angle is obtained when Greenwich hour angle and longitude are added or subtracted. In the example, the navigator's longitude is subtracted from the body's Greenwich hour angle. In this example, the navigator's longitude is added to the Greenwich hour angle. Local hour angle shows, in terms of longitude, the relation between the navigator and the body he is observing. Zenith distance shows the same relation, but differently. It is the great circle distance from a body's geographical position to the observer's position. It is an angular distance on the celestial sphere, having a corresponding linear value on the Earth, and is computed from the altitude. The angle between the horizon and the line from the center of the Earth to the observer's zenith is always 90 degrees. Since light from a star at an infinite distance always strikes the Earth with parallel rays, its altitude or angle with respect to the observer is always the same, whether he is above the Earth on its surface, or theoretically, at its center. In this particular case, the altitude is 60 degrees. Therefore, the angular value of the zenith distance is 30 degrees, or the complement of the altitude. 90 degrees minus the altitude always equals the zenith distance. Because there are 1,800 minutes in 30 degrees, and each minute equals a mile, the linear value of the zenith distance in this example is 1,800 miles. An important conception for the navigator is the circle of position. It is still another way of showing the relationship
between the observer's position and the geographical position of the celestial body being observed. Zenith distance is the radius of this circle. This navigational aid can be illustrated easily. The top of the pole represents a star under observation. The base of the pole represents the geographical position of that star. The length of tape along the ground represents the zenith distance. To see the top of the pole or the star always at the same angle or altitude, the observer must stay on a circle. If the radius is lengthened, the altitude or angle of observation is decreased. If the radius is shortened, the altitude is increased. The navigator's circle of position, however, is on a much larger scale. To repeat, its center is the observed celestial body's geographical position, and its radius is the zenith distance between the geographical position and the observer's position. Obviously, an observer at any point on the circle will observe the same celestial body at the same altitude. Therefore, an altitude, say, of 62 degrees and 33 minutes for a particular celestial body must be secured from any point on a definite circle. But the question that confronts the navigator is, at what particular point am I? To answer this, he constructs another circle of position for another body observed at the same time. He can be on both circles at only two points. The two intersections of the circles are normally so far apart that one may be disregarded because it is obviously incorrect according to his dead reckoning. If globes of suitable size and accuracy could be carried in airplanes, celestial navigation could be simplified by drawing circles of position directly on the globe. But this is out of the question because the navigator must work with maps which represent only a fraction of the Earth's surface. Instead of unwieldy circles of position, he uses minute parts of circles of position, so minute that they are assumed to be straight, without appreciable error. Each of these is called a line of position, or LP, and the intersection of two of them gives the navigator a fixed or definite position on a map. A third line of position based on a third celestial body, may be added to get an additional check. Formerly, the plotting of lines of position depended upon Bowditch's fairly lengthy mathematical solution of the astronomical triangle. The vertices of this triangle are at the nearer pole, the observed body's geographical position, and the observer's position. It was solved by substituting assumed values for any three of the five values involved in the triangle. Today, however, the labor required to solve this triangle has been tremendously reduced. It is now largely a routine procedure involving several index tables of pre-computed data from which values are entered on a standardized form.
In actual practice, the navigator begins with an assumed position. This may be the dead reckoning position, at which he would be if all factors influencing the flight of his airplane have been compensated for, or it may be a position close to and on either side of the dead reckoning position. Using the Greenwich hour angle of the observed body and the longitude of the assumed position, the navigator determines local hour angle. With this value, he enters a set of logarithmic tables and computes what the azimuth and altitude of the observed celestial body would be had it been observed from the assumed position. Let us say that the results of this computation show the navigator that from the assumed position, the azimuth of the observed body is 130 degrees and the altitude 30 degrees. This information enables him to draw a line of position. However, by actual observation, he has found the altitude of the same celestial body to be 29 degrees and 54 minutes. Since the smaller the altitude, farther an observer is from the geographical position, the observer in this case is farther from the geographical position of the body than his assumed position is. This distance is six minutes or six nautical miles and is called the intercept. The new line of position, indicating the navigator's position, is now drawn parallel to the assumed line of position and six miles from it. If the observed altitude should be greater than the calculated altitude, the navigator is closer to the body's geographical position than his assumed position is. We have seen how the position of a celestial body is transferred to the Earth, how Greenwich hour angle and local hour angle are found, and how zenith distance is related to the geographical position of a celestial body and an observer. We also know that zenith distance is the complement of the altitude. From this information, the circle of position and its minute part the line of position are constructed. This knowledge, coupled with the help of time-saving tables, highly developed instruments, and well-planned navigators' compartments, makes position finding on the Earth a rapid routine procedure whose chief requirement is constant practice.